Chelik Yud Ches, Volume 18, the Sicha for Parshas Pinchas slash Yud Beis Yud Gimel Tamas. In this Sicha, the Rebbe will explain the special connection between Yud Beis and Yud Gimel Tamas and Parshas Pinchas, mainly the connection between the previous Rebbe and Pinchas. As an introduction, of course, you're all familiar with the events of Yud Beis Yud Gimel Tamas. Just briefly, this is the anniversary of the release of the previous Rebbe from the Soviet imprisonment in 1927 when he was arrested for spreading Judaism. Also, Yud Beis Tammuz, the 12th of Tammuz, is the Friedrich Rebbe, is the previous Rebbe's birthday. Another thing, we know that the act of Pinchas, where Pinchas went and he killed Zimri and the non-Jewish woman who he was engaging in intimacy with, we know that the sages say in reference to this that Haboyul Aramis Kanoyim Pogimboy. That means that if one engages in intimacy with a non Jewish woman, then only zealots could be the one to strike him. Meaning, this is not halacha. Once it's the act has been done, you cannot now prosecute a person in Bezdin. And even if somebody should come to ask permission to act on this, the Chachamim, the Bezdin, cannot and would not give him permission. In other words, it's something that is totally, as it says, Harishus Biyada, is totally voluntary. It's something that's op- up to a, a person's own personal discretion. Another thing to familiarize ourselves with, the concept of Nidui. That in certain cases, when a person commits a certain act of wrongdoing, you put him in a Nidui, which is in English translated an excommunication, which is really a very severe, let's call it spiritual punishment. In other words, it kind of breaks the person away spiritually. Physically, nothing happens to the person. But spiritually, it kind of separates him from the rest of the community. Another thing, as this Sikha is going to have a little Kabbalah, as we get towards the end of the Sikha, just to familiarize ourselves with the quote, Shame Ban, the name Ban. Ban is Beis Nun, which is the numerical value of 52. What is this, quote, name of Ban? Well, we know that the name of Hashem, which is the name, the source of all creation and everything that happens in this world, is Yud K Vav K. Now, there are several different ways to spell out these letters. Thus, they form the various Shemois, the various, quote, names of Hashem. In other words, when you have, let's say, let's take Yud K Vav K and spell the Yud, Yud Vav Dalit, that will equal 20. Take Vav and spell it with Vav Vav, that is 12. So now we have 32. And I'll take twice Hey and spell it Hey, which is Hey Hey, that's 10. So now we have 52. So thus the name Shem Ban, okay, the expression of godliness as it goes through the channels of the idea, the concept of Shem Ban, which generally, just to put it in very simple terms, this represents the idea of of implementation. So let's go into the Sikha. The Rebbe says these days, the days of the redemption of Yud Beis Yud Gimel Tamuz in 1927, which is the actual year that the Rafidi Rebbe was freed, happened on Tuesday and Wednesday of Parshas Pinchas. Likewise, his birthday, which was in Tafri Shmem 1880, on Yud Beis Tamuz also was in Parshas Pinchas, and in fact, as the previous Rebbe himself writes in reference to this, he says, quote, In the time in which Parshas Pinchas is read, I was born. And most of what happened, most of all of occurrences that happened in my life are reflected, are hinted in Parshas Pinchas, end of quote. So you see that there's a very deep connection very precise connection between the Avoida, the work of, of, of the previous Rebbe and his redemption and Pinchas. Now, where do you see this? Indeed, says the Rebbe, we see that there's a spe- very powerful connection between Pinchas and the name of the previous Rebbe. Previous Rebbe's name is Yosef Yitzchak. Now, Pinchas, the Zayar says, which is Gematria Yitzchak. Pinchas amounts to 208, and Yitzchak amounts to 208. So now we know when there's a Gematria in the Torah, it's not just happenstance, 
but it actually reflects on something of, of a very deep nature, a very deep connection between the two. Something that's so deep that's only reflected in a superficial manner, but really deep down as a very strong connection. So we, and says the Rebbe, not only is there a connection between Pinchas and Yitzchak, the second name of the previous Rebbe, but indeed there's also a connection between Pinchas and the first name of the Friedrich Rebbe, which is Yosef. We know that it says Pinchas is Mizayr Shal Yosef. Pinchas is from the progeny of Yosef. Pinchas is a descendant of Yosef, as it says that Elazar HaKoyin took from the Benois Putiel, from the daughters of Putiel. Who is this Putiel? The Chachamim say that Putiel is Yosef. So, however, the fact that the main connection, or so, so to speak, the more obvious connection, is between the name Yitzchak and Pinchas, this tells us that he has an extra special connection to Pinchas, right? Because the name Yosef is more of a hidden uh, nature, right? It's just that he's from the progeny of Yosef, but it's not a clear and obvious connection to Pinchas. Whereas the name Yitzchak has a more direct and obvious connection to Pinchas, as it has the same numerical value, and it stands out and is brought down in the Zoya. Thus, says the Rebbe, we must say, this must lead us to the conclusion that the idea of Yosef, that, that connects to Pinchas, to the actions of Pinchas, is more of a, in a manner, in a concealed manner, so to speak, somewhat concealed. Whereas Yitzchak is something which is more in the open. Now, what is the connection between the Rebbe and Pinchas? The obvious one, the open one, the revealed one. It's very clear, it's very obvious. Just like Pinchas, he was zealous. And he acted in a way that according to Halacha, meaning according to the letter of the law, there was no obligation to do so. It does, there's no, it does, it's not written in any way that you have to act on it, that you have to do so, as we said in, in the introduction. Moreover, not only it doesn't say that you, that you have to do this, according to Shulchan Aruch, according to Halacha, but even more so, a maiden came. You don't direct anyone to do so. Remember we said, if someone comes and asks, you don't give him the directive to do so. Rather, if one chooses to do on his own, this is only harishus biyadeh, by one's own discretion, by one's own decision. Likewise, we see the same thing by the Friedrich Rebbe. The Mesidus Nefesh that he had in supporting Torah and, and strengthening Judaism, strengthening Yiddishkeit in that country and those times and those circumstances was in a manner of such a manner of Mesidus Nefesh that wasn't even in accordance, so to speak, with Halacha, but rather in a manner that it was on his own discretion, his own initiative. You see, because according to Halacha, we know that that you're only mandated to have Mesidus Nefesh only in three things, only in three severe Avedas, right? That Gil Arayish, Vichas Tamim, and Avedas But anything else, you don't, you're not obligated according to Halacha. You can be a perfectly religious Jew and not engage in Mesidus Nefesh in anything outside of those three. Now, of course, you can ask and you can say, well, the connection, it would seem that this comparison to Pinchas would have more of a connection to the end of Parsha's Balak versus that what we're saying, that it has a connection to Parsha's Pinchas. Because in Parsha's Balak, at the end, of, that's, where, that's where it's recorded the actual act of Pinchas. We're saying that there is a connection, there's a similarity between the previous Rebbe's actions and Pinchas' actions. Then how to come we say, how come the emphasis here is that he has a special connection to Parsha's Pinchas when it would seem that it should be connected to Parsha's Balak. So the Rebbe says to understand this, we'll bring from a Gemara Yerushalmas, from the Jerusalem Talmud, that says the following, that when Pinchas did what he did, when he acted as he did, the Chachamim, the sages of the time, they actually sought to excommunicate him. If not for the fact that the heavenly voice came out, and where is that heavenly voice recorded? In Parshas Pinchas. In Parshas Pinchas it says that it says, That Hashem says that he acted on my behalf, and quote, it will be to him and to all his progeny after him, there will be a covenant of priesthood forever and ever. In other words, that means that Pinchas had not only Mesidus Nefesh, not only did he have self-sacrifice, big goof, in his body, so to speak, meaning that he would have, he could have, God forbid, 
and he did endanger himself physically, but he also, as we see over here from this year's Shalmi, then he had also spiritual Mesiris Nefesh. In other words, the Chachamim so much disagreed with him, the sages were so against what he did that they were ready to excommunicate him. As we said in the introduction, this is a spiritual punishment. This is a spiritual harm to the person, more so than the physical. And yet, Pinchas did not in any way consider any of this, and he still acted on saving the Yidin and getting them out of this nonsensical situation that they were in. And this type of conduct we also see by the previous Rebbe, says, says the Rebbe. I'm sorry, this type of conduct stems from what? It stems up from Etzem HaNefesh, from the essence of the soul, from the source of the soul, from the highest point in the soul, which transcends any whatsoever consideration, even, so to speak, the consideration of halacha and what is mandatory and not. And we see that what did this trigger? This also triggers the response from Hashem, meaning the reward from Hashem, that what did Pinchas get? Pinchas received for this kohuna. He received for this priesthood for him and for his children, all his progeny after him, which is also, if you think about it, out of line with the Hagbolis of Torah, with the limitations of Torah. You see, according to the Torah, the way it was already set according to the Torah, only Aaron and his sons who have been already appointed to be Kayanim, and their future progeny could be Kayanim. According to the status quo of the Torah, Pinchas could not be a Kayan, not he, and therefore not his future descendants. But over here, this overrided that, this overrode that. And this overrided this fact, and it became that he too became a Kayin, meaning he acted in a manner which was a way higher and beyond, so to speak, the norms of Torah, and the reward was likewise. Says the Rebbe, this type of conduct we also find by the previous Rebbe. That although, notwithstanding the fact that there were many Rabbonim and great Jewish leaders of his time, that they did not understand his ways. They just, they couldn't understand and therefore they didn't agree with it. And according to their opinion, it was preferable not to engage in any discord with the government, rather to try to leave this country, leave the country as quiet and as quickly as possible, but not to like, you know, upset the apple cart, so to speak, not to make any problems and not to endanger what already does exist in Judaism. Their even argument was, if you're going to go on the Siddhis Nefesh and you're going to create a tumult, what's a tumult, what's going to be, perhaps you're going to ruin it for those that still have something left of Judaism, the few shows that are still open and so on. But still yet, the Rebbe, he acted in the Siddhis Nefesh. Not only physically did he endanger himself, but also spiritually that he was absolutely dedicated, especially to the education of young little children, which this was the biggest thorn in the eyes of the Soviets. This was exactly what set him up, more so than any of his other actions, like ensuring mikvahs, or ensuring that there be rabbonim and shaykhtim in the cities. That didn't bother them as much. That wouldn't have stirred up all the problems as much as his insistence on seeing to it that the little children learn. And that is, if you think about it, that is a, a spiritual mysterious method, because this would have, could have undermined, which it almost did, it could have undermined the entire operation of all the spiritual things which are mandated, as the Rebbe says in another sicha, those things are obligated according to halacha. Adults have to go have to go to mikvah, adults have to go to shul, adults have to eat kosher food and have shayuchtim and Little children to learn alabez is not a mandatory thing. And that's where the previous Rebbe went on Mesiris Nefesh, and this is how the Rebbe coins it a spiritual Mesiris Nefesh. What happened afterwards? After his release, what was the reaction? What was the, so to speak, response to this? Then it became clear that no, no, not only you could do it, but you must do it and must continue on with the work. And now we'll understand the connection between Pinchas and Yitzchak and see that absolute connection. That Yitzchak Avinu, where, what was his mysterious nefesh? By Akedas Yitzchak, by the binding of Yitzchak. What happened by the binding of Yitzchak? Of course, 
He put himself, he subjected himself to physical danger. He could have been killed. But there's more than that. There is a Mesiris Nefesh Beruchnius. There is this spiritual Mesiris Nefesh. How so? First of all, this, if he would have been killed, this would have shut down Hashem's promise, the Yitzchak Yikarla Chazara, that through Yitzchak will be Am Yisrael. Imagine, the whole Am Yisrael, he was subjecting himself to death voluntarily. He didn't have to. Hashem never told him that he has to lie down and get himself killed by his father. He told it to Avraham Avinu. And yet Yitzchak subjected himself to this mysterious nefesh, knowing that if he dies, with him goes the promise of the future of Am Yisrael, number one. Number two, with him goes any possibility of propagating and continuing the teachings of Avram Avinu, meaning the utmost spiritual sacrifice. And yet, Yitzchak Avinu was ready to do it. So we see that special connection between Yitzchak and Pinchas, thus between the previous Rebbe's name, Yitzchak, and his actions, and Pinchas. Says the Rebbe, having said all of this, still, to take it a step further, there is still a difference between the Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, and Pinchas. Why? Because the previous Rebbe also had the name Yosef. Not only is his name Yitzchak, but his name is Yosef Yitzchak. In Kabbalah and Hasidah, says the Rebbe, it says that Yosef, if you take the numerical value of Yosef, it's gematria, it corresponds to three times ban. Three times 52. Three times the value of 52. If you take the word Yitzchak, it corresponds to four times ban, four times the number 52. If you recall in the introduction, we said what ban means, it's a an expression of Hashem's name, Shem Ban. Now, therefore, you have the Gimel and you have the Dalit. Gimel is three, Dalit is four. What does the Gimel and the Dalit stand for? What do they represent? We know that the the Aleph base, the Hebrew Aleph base, are not just letters, but they also have meaning and character. They have soul, so to speak. The Gimel represents the Gimel Dalit. Bestowing to the poor, meaning gemilas chasadim, or in plain simple English, the mode of giving, of giving to others. Dalit is, it represents the word dalim, dal, which means the poor, the recipient. Now in general, the giving, the gimel, cannot be complete, cannot be whole, until you have the recipient, the dalit, who makes it whole. Who completes it. In other words, even if one should, in plain simple uh, practical example, so one should want to do chesed, one should want to give. If the recipient doesn't receive, that doesn't complete the circle, that doesn't complete the circuit of giving, because you have to have the giver and you have to have the recipient. Thus, the dalid completes the gimel. The dalid, the dal, the poor, the recipient, the receiver, he completes the gimel, the goimel, the one who bestows, the one who gives. Now, so in every situation of giver and recipient, the dalit is the one that really makes it happen. The receiver is the one that completes it. And we actually see this also in the four worlds, For exa- as an example. You have atzilus, biria, yitzira, which all, although there's different ways to divide them, but all in general, generally compared to the lowest world, asiya, which is action, our world of action, they are considered to be the spiritual worlds versus our, which is the more physical world, the more material, the more corporal world. But nothing becomes complete. Atzilus, Biriya, Yitzira cannot really be truly expressed and complete without Asiya. Thus you see again the Dalit, the four, the number four completes the three. Now we know in general that Yosef, in, when it comes to the Sfiris, is the Bechinas HaYesoit, Yesoid is the end of all the spheres right before Malchus. Yesoid is the giver, the one who is mashpia and gives to the level below it. Yitzchak, which is four, this corresponds to Malchus, the recipient. So now let's go to Pinchas, as it is Yitzchak, versus as the Friedrich Rebbe is, not just Yitzchak, but also Yosef Yitzchak. You see, Pinchas indeed represents action. Right? The Dalit, the number four, Yitzchak. But there is still a lacking of the Yosef. Let's put it in practical terms. In everything we do, there is a Nasa and there is a Nishma. 
There is the action, and then there is the nishma, the teaching, the giving, right? The nishma, in order for there to be a nishma, you have to have someone to teach. True, by Yitzchak, he stood out, I mean, by Pinchas, by Yitzchak, he stood out in the action. But by, he, there was still somewhat of a missing, so to speak, lacking that aspect of nishma, of the giving, the Yosef aspect. By the previous Rebbe, however, we have both. We have the Yosef, which is the teacher that's in him, the Nasi that's in him, the leader that's in him, the one who gives, the one who teaches to the whole entire generation. And then you also have, as we saw clearly and evidently, the Yitzchak, the action, the implementation, the actual Mesidus Nefesh. And we see this reflected in the way he conducted himself. In the very same time, that he was engaged, totally de- dedicated and occupied with Mesidus Nefesh, to build mikvahs, to send Rabbanim, to send Shaykhtim, to start yeshivas, and as we said before, to even start Chadarim, little schools for little children, so they can learn Aleph base, the primary letters of the Torah, which is corresponds to Nasa, to the action, to the implementation phase, at the very same time, he was engaged with and occupied with the teaching the deepest secrets of Chassidus, writing and, te- and, and reciting my Maimorim and spreading Chassidus, which is the phase of Nishna. And this is what, says the Rebbe, he demanded from all of us. This is the Hayra, this is directed for all of us. That primarily, we have to be in the mode of Nasa, of action, of Yitzchak, of Pinchas, which is Pashit literally to go out there and see to it that every single yid, even a yid that may not seem on the surface to, quote, be ready for it yet, may not understand it yet, that that yid should be engaged actively in doing as many mitzvahs as possible, getting a yid to do mitzvahs, regardless of their mindset, and regardless of how much they think that they are or aren't prepared for it. You have to act that they should become actively engaged in doing mitzvahs. And because we are connected, we are Makusha to the Rebbe, so of course we also have the advantage of being able to teach, to teach Chassidus as we are connected not only to the Yitzchak aspect of the Rebbe, but also to the Yosef. And this brings us, says the Rebbe, this will bring us to the Geula. A, it will bring us to the Besura Selio, the good tidings that Elio Navi will bring, which is Elio Navi stands out in the Nasa. Because it says that Elio is about action. As it says, what is his purpose? That he'll be the one to steer the hearts of fathers over the sons. Meaning because of the sons. Meaning he's going to do, he's going to implement. And this will bring us the Geula, says the Rebbe, that is connected to four, to the Dalit. As we know, the Geula is um, represented in the four expressions of the Geula. As we drink the kaisas, they drink the cups at the night of the Seder. And also... As the promise Hashem gives that he says that when Mashiach comes, he's going to give the nations of the world, those who tormented us, four cups of punishment, four measures of punishment. And in that stead, corresponding to that, he will give us four cups of consolation, four cups of Nechamah.